Good morning. I, uh, I don't need that. That's right. Um, I hope uh, I hope Zoe outlives me because we're using this as my eulogy. This is <laughs> wow. Well, I laugh. It's not a funny thing, but my father had passed in the past, and my my dad was a triple A personality, and. Uh, he wrote his obituary. He goes, I don't want you to get anything wrong, because I've seen you and your brother write before. But uh, anyway, he worked for Lockheed, did a lot of defense work. So most of the stuff he talked about, he couldn't even discuss with us. But uh, it was very concise, and uh, I love him uh, even to today. Um, so uh, today, uh, you know, they, when you do these uh, talks, presidential talks, they really don't give you a topic. They don't tell you what to talk about, uh, what, uh, what, what things to emphasize. But um, I decided uh, what I would do is talk a little bit about AI and then a couple of pillars uh, of medicine that I really strongly believe in. And I wanted to maybe marry the two and try to figure out uh, how AI will affect those. So I'll talk a little bit about that. I know when you're looking at those pictures of Zoe had put up uh, about me, you're thinking, okay, wait a minute, this guy's got brown hair. Who is this guy standing in front of us? And um, a funny story, when I went to get my real ID in uh, San Diego, I, uh, you know, I kind of put it off, actually. And, and then I finally went in and got in line and got to the front. And, and the gal looks at me, and she hands me the application of the last few things I had to write down. And she said, um, she said, you're in trouble. And I'm going, oh God, now what? Did I, did I miss a parking ticket? Did I get my registration not go through? And, and, uh, and I said, well, what happened? What's wrong? And she said, well, we don't have your hair, hair color on this application. And I said, well, it's gray. And she goes, no, it's white. And I thought, <laughs> OK, we're, we're, we're starting there, right? Um, but anyway, uh, so it was my pleasure uh, and honor, really, to speak on NASA's behalf in um, really multiple countries. Um, I think I started in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I went to uh, Australia after that. Uh, we did um, Thailand. Um, then I ended up going to Chile. And uh, I have yet to, uh, to do uh, Belgium and then Dubai uh, towards the end of the year. But at each of these places, uh, what I was struck by is uh, the warm uh, acceptance of NAS to their educational uh, events. Uh, uh, NAS really is a high bar for education. And uh, we should be very proud of that. Um, I know uh, as president, I get updates on attendance. And I can tell you, we're already past 4,500. And it looks like we'll finally finish closer to 5,000, which is an amazing um, uh, thing to do from going through two years of COVID, uh, and staff cuts, and things like that. And our, our NAS staff should be very proud of what they've done. Um, it's been an amazing meeting so far. So. Um, so when I, 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 I tried to decide, how am I doing here, OK? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, exactly, uh, you know, when I, when I give all these talks internationally, all of a sudden you start to think, well, maybe I have something really important to say. And um, oh, you know, a clicker, that's what I'm looking for. OK. And, uh, you know, and then you're thinking, OK, well, John's starting to get a big head. Maybe he won't be able to get out of this room. But I'll tell you how my wife and my family keep my feet very planted uh, firmly on the ground. I, uh, she sent me with a honeydew list uh, out to Home Depot. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a hardware store. Uh, it's probably where most men go with their list of things that their wives have told them to do for the weekend. And I, it had a list of about seven things. And so I said, OK, well, these are some big items. I'm, I'm going to need to. Uh, I'm going to need to get a, have a bigger car. So my wife drives an SUV. And uh, I have a, a smaller car than that. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to fit all these things in. So I'm going to take her car. And uh, what you have to know is my wife's about six, five and a, or six, six and a half. And I'm six, two. And when I get into her car, most people watching me drive her car think I'm getting too familiar with the steering wheel. So I, I you know, have to hit the button. And uh, on the door, and um, you know I'm I'm pressing the button, nothing's happening, and I'm thinking, okay, 
Now I've got number eight things on my list of honeydews to do. So I write down, you know, stop by uh, uh, Acura, to, you know, check out the car, figure out the door panel, and, and off I go. So I'm driving along, and after about 15, 20 seconds, I'm kind of chuckling to myself. And I'm going, there's nothing wrong with that door panel. Does anybody know what I didn't do right? You're right. I hit number one. I'm number two in her car. <laughs> so that tells you how things keep very, uh, very humble in our family. <laughs> so my, my talk today is on artificial intelligence and uh, how it affects uh, the art of medicine and the physician-patient relationship. And as I mentioned before, these are things that are very important to me. And I think they're things that we have to maintain through an advocacy effort in Washington, D.C., and really with uh, all legislation we work with, because um, those two things uh, should not change. And I think that's possible to do if we make the right uh, guidance of them. So here we are in LA, and uh, you have to have a movie clip in LA, because that's kind of the way it works here. And so uh, I decided to put a movie clip in um, about a uh, movie done by Stanley Kubrick. He uh, produced it and directed it in 1968. And uh, it's uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. And I'm sure many people have seen it, and everybody who has non-gray hair probably have seen it on reruns. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting movie because uh, it was really uh, a movie set up, uh, off of a short story by Arthur Clarke. And, um, and it's funny, too, about the short story because he ended up having to write the book while the movie was going on. And Kubrick wanted to release the movie because he needed the money. And, uh, and Arthur Clarke wanted him to wait until the book came out, but he didn't, that didn't happen. Uh, but anyway, the, the story is about two uh, uh, astronauts that are being sent to a moon of Jupiter. And it's primarily due to the fact that something was found on a previous trip that maybe makes uh, them think there might be uh, life on other planets. And, uh, and so um, the astronauts have to make this trip, which requires them to really travel weeks and months before they even get there. And so they think they're not going to make it unless we give them um, a, an AI computer. And they sent them with the HAL 9000. Well, the HAL 9000 is what we would consider a generative AI um, a computer right now, or device. And um, it basically uh, is supposed to be able to do everything and never get tired. And this is allowing them to get to Jupiter. So uh, the clip's about uh, the two astronauts realize that the, com the computer's sort of acting erratically. It's singing. It's, um, it's, it's just making strange comments. And so, they're, so they decided they met in a room. And they were very careful to turn off all the audio devices um, uh, in there and so the computer wouldn't hear them. And they talked about, OK, we have to dismantle or turn this computer off because we're not going to make it to Jupiter. Uh, something, he's going to do something strange to, to sabotage the trip. Um, and so uh, the clip uh, talks about uh, the interaction with HAL 9000 um, after that discussion. And they travel through time. So in that day, they thought that was the, putting bright colors and moving past them showed that they kind of were, were traveling at the speed of light. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. 
I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Dave, hey, although you took very thorough precautions in the part against my hearing you, I could see your lips move. All right, Hal. I'll go in through the emergency airlock. Without your space helmet, Dave, you're going to find that rather difficult. Hal, I won't argue with you anymore. Open the doors. Dave, this conversation can serve no purpose anymore. Goodbye. Hal, <laughs> turn on my talk. Turn on my talk, Hal. Thank you. <laughs> well, this tells us an interesting thing about AI. Generative AI has a self-preservation button. And this is something we have to think about. Because if for some reason uh, it decides that what we had thought would be the best uh, way to handle a problem, and it decides to its multiple ways of, of looking through neural networks that it's been set up with, it may change our decision plan. And we have to be prepared for that, and we have to have guidelines for this. Otherwise, it'll be very difficult for us to intermix AI with medicine. But the practice of medicine is an art based in science. And that's really a top, uh, that phrase was uh, attributed to Hedge in 1999. But the reality is, I think many people were thinking along this line previous to this. But why do we? practice the art of medicine a little bit different at the end of our career than we do at the beginning. And we all know the answer to it. Um, experience, uh, technology, uh, everything changes. And if you're in uh, medical oncology and radiation oncology, it changes every three months. I mean, we have a, a good friends of ours uh, that opened a cancer center up in uh, Truckee and by Lake Tahoe. And um, I, I'm just amazed um, how fast their, their studies and their treatment of cancer has changed over the last uh, couple years. So, you know, how will AI really alter the practice of medicine? Well, a little background, artificial intelligence kind of was really started in the 1950s. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about two people that were instrumental in it. But an article uh, recently said, that there, it will contribute $15.7 trillion by 2030. And, and I will tell you, I think that is a very conservative number. I think it's going to be way higher than that. Um, and it's interesting, the article also said the largest impact of AI is going to be in the field of healthcare. And we all see the obvious part, you know, unwinding, going through these stacks of medical records um, that have been handwritten and some typed. Now it's all on computer, thank goodness, because that's improving our record review. But they're going to start doing um, what they call power diagnosis, or, or looking into these uh, different interconnections of past histories. That's going to be very helpful. But um, the way we currently use it, or one of the ways that we currently use it is um, in interpreting MRIs. Uh, MRIs, if you know a little bit about them, is um, how protons, uh, they let off a spin with different tissues. And um, according to whether the tissue is an, uh, normal or diseased, it'll give off a different spin pattern. And, um, and so uh, the, the human eye can see probably, I don't know, some people will say we can see about six or eight different shades of gray. But a machine can see probably significantly more than that, maybe four 
40 times better uh, review of, of shades of gray. And that's going to give us a, a much different analysis of our MRIs. Uh, this is just an example. For breast cancer, um, we usually take a, a mammogram, you know, and that's a couple of views, maybe two or three shots, and various slices. But an MRI has multiple slices, even one millimeter, two millimeter slices, and it can evaluate each of these. So MRI is really used to check uh, the likelihood of a breast cancer for somebody who has very dense tissue or somebody who's had implants in the past or early stage cancer. So the recommendation currently, I think, is to have them do their mammogram and biopsy. But for those high risk patients um, with family history and gene for breast cancer, uh, an MRI with AI evaluation is definitely the way to go. So these two individuals have both won Turing Awards. And Turing Awards is a computer uh, science uh, innovation award. And uh, John McCarthy, I think, uh, got the award prior to Jeffrey Hinton. But John McCarthy was a computer in cognitive science. And he really coined the term artificial intelligence. He described it as the science and engineering of making machines smart. And um, he was sort of uh, given this honor of sort of starting artificial intelligence, mainly because he wrote a computer program called LISP. But it was, a, it was different than most programs that had been written before. Very flexible and very good at problem solving capabilities. Jeffrey Hinton is a, a, a British a scientist, cognitive psychologist and a computer scientist. But he developed, and you might have seen him on uh, 60 Minutes recently about AI. But he had developed artificial neural networks. And his whole plan of doing this was to set up very complicated layers of uh, algorithms. And then where he got the Turing Award war, uh, for was allowing these uh, layers of, uh, of um, algorithms to communicate between one another. And that just expanded the, their abilities to um, find diagnosis, to find problem solving issues. Um, so he received the award for that. And, and um, we all should be very indebted to his work. Um, but a recent article that he said, uh, he made some comments. And he said, really, now is the time to set up these guidelines and boundaries. And if we don't, um, it will get to the point where AI is setting up its own guidelines and its own boundaries. And that is something that I think uh, won't be in all of our best interest. So artificial intelligence really is software, really rapidly analyzes data, aggregates the information, and tries to find patterns and, and presents them back to us in ways that should be easier for us to understand. But when you use the words like learn, understand, perceive, respond, are these really good terms to use when you're describing artificial intelligence? And is language without emotion or, or empathy really meaningful? So I was in, um, where was I? Uh, Czech Republic. And I saw a Frankfurt Times that was written in English. And I thought, OK. This looks fun. And there was an article about artificial intelligence. I thought, OK, this is, this is fun. Let me look into this. And there were two comments that were made in this article, which I thought were very poignant. First one was, he really thought artificial intelligence should have been described as applied statistics in the 1950s. And probably in the 1950s, it was, because it was just basically doing sort of what we call Boolean uh, uh, evaluation of things, where it's a zeros or one, black and white. Uh, data collection and spitting it out. Uh, so it really was more applied statistics. But the other comment he made, which I thought was very poignant, it said, when one person teaches another person, this represents an interaction between consciousness. An AI machine is not conscious. So there's something called large language models. And this is something probably uh, most people are familiar with. It's a chat GBT, Google's BARD. Uh, but it rearranges the material that already exists. And when it does that, we really can't mistake that for comprehension. Different types of intelligence, very narrow, general to super. And super intelligence is really, I think, what we're all dealing with now at AI. Greater memory, faster data processing, much better decision uh, capabilities. There are different types of learning. There's memory learning. This is something that's really based on the reinforcement learning concept, where we interpret, process, and analyze the data. 
And then there's deeper learning, where it's advanced machine learning, face recognition, self-driving cars, virtual assistants like Siri. Natural language processing is something that Twitter used to find terroristic language. And it's, it's an insight into human language and trying to find patterns that are typical of, of certain types of uh, situations. And then, of course, robotics, we're all familiar with artificial agents acting in a real-world environment. So what's the difference between these machines? There's reactive machines. They're a little more primitive. They don't really learn. Uh, people are familiar with this and the IBM Deep Blue and the fact that it beat multiple chess uh, champions. There was an article just recently in, I think, one of, I think the New York Times about one of um, the Norwegian chess champion who is very famous, I think, you know, has been a, a champion over many years, many, many tournaments, and he actually lost to a 23-year-old. And he couldn't quite figure it out. He, he gave him credit for what a great, you know, game he, play, he played and great chess, chess match, but he couldn't help but notice that he was wearing a digital watch. And he thought to himself, you know, if you had the ability to, to know the last thousand moves of chess champions, could you have actually beat somebody? And the answer is yes. Now, they never proved that he used that, but I thought that was interesting that, that uh, he made that comment. So there's uh, limited memory machines, and these are really chatbots and self-driving uh, vehicles. And then there's theory of the mind machines, and they interpret needs, emotions, and beliefs. This is where I think it may, um, uh, this type of thing is going to be more important for medicine and AI. And then, of course, there's self-aware machines. And this is a little bit about the movie clip we just saw. It evokes emotion, develops self-awareness, and the key word, self-preservation for the device. So uh, it's funny that, that uh, my wife sent this cartoon to, to Zoe to put up, but I had to write five articles for Spineline this year. And I thought, nobody's going to read these articles unless I put a cartoon or something in there. So I kept sending these to it. And I laughed because uh, Todd Wetzel is the editor. And I'm sure when he, when he, when he was reading these, uh, see, my, my goal in life is to make Todd grin a little bit. And so if I can make him grin, then I know, OK, this is going to be a pretty good, pretty good uh, cartoon. But, um, but there's a term called fuzzy logic. And uh, it's when computers uh, make decisions on degrees of truth. And I think that's actually where generative AI is going. Uh, they don't use the Boolean nature, the uh, zero ones, black and white sort of decision making. It's degrees of truth, and then they find patterns within that, and that's where they're going to make their advanced decisions. Uh, but that's what's going to be also used in the medical field for problem solving and decision making. You know, modern medical care is really demanding. It, it, with the way we, people are with their phones and their ability to find information quickly, it, you almost have to find the answer as rap rapidly as they're generating the questions. You know, all of us cringe when a patient says, can you write down my diagnosis? You know, and typically it's, it's big science words, so it's, it's hard to, for them to write down themselves. So you write it down, and you know what they're doing with it. They're going back to their computer, and they're trying to figure out what their diagnosis is and how it's best treated. But you have to keep that in mind. Now, in, the, in the, my day of, of going through training, uh, it used to be the black box theory. You know, you'd come to a patient, you'd examine them, you'd come up with a black box of possible differential diagnosis. You figure out how you're going to do the appropriate test to separate that out and come up with a diagnosis. Well, this sort of uh, process of deduction has really lost its allure with the new generation of uh, doctors. They're not interested in going through the black facts. They, they want immediate answers, and they're going to find that probably through AI. So we're really expected to diagnose at the same speed that our patients navigate their activities of daily living. So this is the other pillar I think that's very important. When I go to Washington, D.C., I harp on this because uh, I think our legislators uh, also agree with us. There's a physician-patient relationship uh, that's important. And um, it means listening more than talking. It means giving your undivided attention. And you have to build up a trust with your patients. And that's kind of what we do. And that's our professional obligation. There is a human connection that I think is important that AI may not be able to duplicate. 
Um, and that's that connection between medicine and family. When we check a patient in for surgery in the morning, uh, we go to say hello, see how they're doing, um, you know, any changes in how you're feeling. Uh, one of the things we do is we sign the area that we're going to work on. So that's kind of one of our fact checks. Uh, but then I always ask them, you know, is one leg worse than the other, one side of your back worse than the other, you know, kind of a little more information. And then I always finish by saying, is there somebody you'd like me to, to, to uh, talk to afterwards? And usually, oh, please call my wife, please call my sister, family member. And I had this very nice lady uh, in her 80s, I think, and she, um, she said, you know, Doc, I really don't have anybody. And then you kind of think, wow, you know, what, what kind of situation is that? And if, if there was an AI computer checking somebody in, how would they react to that? You know, and you know, I looked at the team around them, I said, okay, we're your family today, we'll look out for you. And that was comforting uh, to her. So when you, when you interact with patients, it can be difficult. And there's silence frequently, and it's uncomfortable sometimes. You have to understand people are coming to you with chronic pain, and they're depressed because they can't get this pain to go away. And they're a little angry and a little bit upset that uh, modern medicine can't figure it out. So already you're working with people that are um, uh, not exactly your best friend right off the bat. Uh, but it really demands your full attention and sometimes can be unrewarding. Um, so we have to figure out how AI can help us um, answer questions for them better without stopping or taking away that physician-patient relationship. And here's one way I still think we can we out, uh, outdo the computers, and it's laying on of the hands. I mentioned this at a dinner the other night to folks. It's amazing how patients will feel as though you've figured out their diagnosis by duplicating the pain they have with simple palpation. And you know, all the physicians in here know that that helps us a little bit, but it definitely doesn't give us the diagnosis. Um, but it's nice to know that, that that touch, that laying on my hands, does make a difference. And uh, I think that's something right now that AI can't duplicate. Osteopathic, chiropractic care involves palpation manipulation, and I think this is their answer to, um, to laying on of the hands. So why is it important for us to build robots that look like humans? I mean, this is sort of, when I thought about this, I said, okay, this is sort of a silly topic, but the reality is, I think it's um, creating the image of an AI machine and, a, uh, and giving it human behavior is kind of part of the illusion. Um, it's a machine. It is not conscious. It's not human. But I think creators are developing this humanoid figure to improve some acceptance of the technology. Uh, there was an article uh, recently that was sort of a review of an article in 2017. And it was about um, residents uh, in one of the big hospitals using chatbot to, um, in an unexpected way. And what they were doing is they were using it to figure out what the right words uh, were to break bad news to patients and express concern. And apparently it was helpful. And I thought back in my career and I thought, OK, how many times have I been in this situation? And I thought of one that just really sticks out in my mind. I was a resident on neurosurgery um, in my residency in, at Harvey UCLA in Torrance, California, uh, Southern California. And uh, we had just admitted a, a gentleman, sort of his mid-20s, uh, late 20s, to the ICU. Um, he had been putting up Christmas lights, so it was during the holiday. And, um, and he fell off the roof, and he hit his head. Um, and his, um, he had a wife, uh, also in the mid-20s. And uh, after being in the ICU for a couple days, we realized that um, he's not going to make it. And so um, <clears throat> the chief resident said, uh, John, go out there and, and tell the wife. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, OK. I mean, I'm a, I mean I, yes, I'm a doctor. I've completed medical school. But uh, nobody coaches you on dealing with that type of news. And um, 
And of course, they had to go out there and tell him that he wasn't going home with her. And that was, that was hard. Um, so I can see where residents would look at ChatGPT and say, OK, how can you help me with this problem? So artificial intelligence can add to our perspective. It will definitely subtract from your confidence. When you hit a button and they give you 15 reasons why this is happening, and you could think of only four or five, you kind of go, wow. Uh, it, but it does multiply our options. It, it possibly will discourage human interaction, which can be good or bad, depending on who you interact with. But um, AI is, is a creative process, and the goal should be try to figure out how it can be a value, valuable uh, driver of human flourishing. So there's a term called AI hallucinations. And um, what it basically is is creating false data. Um, I, I know probably all of you have seen the 60 Minutes piece where they fed in a question about, can you give us some references on a certain topic? And, um, and AI almost instantly came back with three books. And, um, you know, and then they checked a little bit further. They go, wow, that's amazing, amazing. And then I guess the staff did some work looking at it later on. And it turns out uh, all three books were fictitious. And even the quotes that were from that book were fictitious. Um, and so these are things that we're going to have to be able to set guidelines to and barriers and way to determine that before we act on, on information given to us by AI. But it's probably less likely to occur with patient data, because that's usually specific data. But I think errors such as hallucination are going to be very important for us to, to curb uh, in the field of medicine, obviously in aviation, and with the military. This is a, a picture sent to me by a patient. And I'm thinking to myself that the tattoo picture, you know, AI is going to have a visual port. How are they going to react to a, a photograph like this? Um, I don't know how I react to it, other than, wow, that's a lot of work. Um, but, uh, but you know, as a surgeon, you know, you got to make a midline cut. So now you got to figure out how you're going to put that back together when you're done. But um, the picture on the right was a gentleman who had come into the ER when I was a resident who had been uh, hit by a shotgun at long distance. And uh, those are all pellets that are embedded in the skin, uh, in the neck and the skull. So, and, that, and he actually did well. He did fine. So, um, so it, we're going to have to teach AI, and it will learn from experience and, and time and data processing what's important, what's not important, and how to react to things like this. There's also something called imposter syndrome. And that's getting a lot of. Uh, notoriety now, especially in LA with screenwriters and things like that, because they're using their um, written, written pages and mixing it around, and all of a sudden that becomes a new creation, which uh, in reality, that's not true. So it's crediting something with being an enhancer of creativity. And a lot of people think what AI can do to, um, to various things in a creative way is really not as creative as we think. So we're getting to the point where technology is getting so advanced. Will it really be dictating required medical care? And that, this is a big question. And um, often new procedures, new uh, surgeries are submitted for a CPT code. And they get approved um, because they, don't, they do seem to be legitimate. There's science behind it. And, uh, there, there are people getting good results with it. So they're given a CPT code, which is how we bill for procedures and, and uh, evaluations. And by getting a CPT, CPT code, does that really mean it's a gold standard treatment? And the answer probably is no. And we also have to think about our advancing of technology, while it's important, are we really changing the valuation equation the way we want to? And remember, value is quality over cost. And we're trying to make that better for everybody because of the expense of medical care. But in reality, we're finding that the cost of the technology is so uh, high that it's really not doing us a favor with regard to value. So the goals of AI should really be to be a tool that benefits everybody's life. 
Does it need to be involved in everything we do, or can we choose to use it when we want? I think that's actually going to be the best way for us to deal with it. It will definitely create uh, contribute to our creative process, and I think we'll be using especially generative AI in the future for that reason. But we will have to be careful because large AI devices are really being owned by the mega corporations. And are we creating further inequalities in our, our businesses by allowing that to happen? So going back to what I talked about before, art of medicine and physician-patient relationship, important for us to maintain that with our legislator in DC. This is a sculpture I did for a friend of mine who, after his 2000th uh, delivery, uh, he's no longer with us, but uh, he was a, a physician who I uh, admired, and uh, he felt strongly about art of medicine and the physician-patient relationship. So that sculpture sits in the Women's Center in La Mesa uh, in the uh, San Diego area. So in conclusion, AI should always be a tool that improves the quality of patient care. It should never be a substitute for human touch or conscious interaction. And I do feel strongly about that. It will be part of our healthcare system in the future. So we have to prepare for it. We have to use it. We have to guide it. Uh, but it is coming, and we, uh, it's going to be part of our practice. But how we incorporate it in our practice shouldn't really alter the physician-patient relationship or eliminate the art of medicine. So you had a, a preview on these from Zoe, but uh, parents on the left, uh, dad was actually a VP uh, for Lockheed and uh, worked in space and missiles uh, department. Uh, and he was a big believer in a strong defense uh, will keep you out of trouble on an international basis. And I still do believe that. My mom was a school teacher, taught various grades, but ended up in elementary school. Family on the right. My son, my oldest son, is on the far right. He's a computer graphic artist, and I know he's looking at my talk going, Dad, I could have done way better on this than you. But, you know, it is what it is. You know, I, I didn't want to worry about it. These are my mentors, and I wanted to mention them because they're important in my life. John Kostowick, um, I was actually supposed to go to Toronto, and I had an apartment and everything. And uh, about March of the year, I was supposed to be there in July or August. I can't even remember now. And uh, he said, John, get rid of your place in Toronto. We're going to Baltimore. And I'm, I'm going, wait a minute. I, first of all, I sold my wife on the idea of quitting her job and moving back east because we're going to Toronto, something interesting and new. And now I'm going to tell her, the, the plan's all off. We're going to Baltimore. But um, um, Jim Nugent and I were his first fellows at uh, Johns Hopkins. And uh, he taught us a lot. I mean, he. He was getting the worst of the worst, uh, the fifth operation, the sixth operation. Um, really, you, what you'll see, and all the spine surgeons in the, in the audience know this, after about the third or fourth uh, operation, the anatomy is nothing like it's supposed to be. I mean, you're, you're not going to find a, a smooth transfer process or a pedicle that's not been disturbed. You're working. Uh, with an anatomy that's a whole different uh, story. You can figure out some of it from CT, 3D CT, but I think this is where navigation will be helping us in the future. Uh, the more of these surgeries we do on the third or fourth or fifth procedure are really going to need guidance uh, that's different than what you can get uh, with direct visualization. And then Randy Davis I ran into while I was there, and he uh, was a private uh, practice doc and taught me what it's like to be a private practice spine surgeon. And um, the other thing that Randy was amazingly good at uh, was cervical spine surgery. And so I, uh, now my practice is almost 50% cervical, 50% lumbar. But uh, I attribute uh, all my abilities to handle that uh, to Randy, because he was a great instructor. The other person at Hopkins was uh, Donlin Long. And I don't know whether anybody knows him, but he was chief of neurosurgery for a long time. And one of the nice things about Hopkins is they get together orthopedics and neurosurgery on a weekly basis to review cases and discuss how they would go after them. And I learned a lot about uh, nerve preservation and decompressions uh, from that um, group. Uh, and obviously, orthopedics is, has always been good on stabilizing and the mechanics of medicine. Board of directors, as Zoe said, we had to make some tough decisions this year. Um, and they were hard to do, a lot of discussion. Everybody had a chance to speak. But um, 
as a, as a good board should do, we come to a final decision. And um, most of the time it was unanimous. A few times it was very close. But at least everybody knew the pros and cons of what we were getting into. And um, uh, you should be proud of the board. They did an amazing job. Uh, nobody hit each other. Nobody yelled. And we were able to get through it and uh, guide NAFs to a better future. And as Zoe said, uh, you can't say enough about the NAFs staff. Um, you know, we're all volunteers that work uh, on the board for NAS and do the various things in the committees. Um, and we have practices and families and things that are important. So it's very difficult for us to run an organization that's probably close to 7,000 members, both nationally and internationally. Uh, we, we run coding, we run guidelines, we um, run publications. In fact, our the, uh, the spine journal gets an impact factor that's the highest in the world, I think, for spine journals. And that was something that, um, that the, the society decided to embark on uh, quite some time ago. Really weren't sure whether it was going to work or not. And, um, and it did very well. And like I said, it's at the pinnacle of uh, uh, spine publication. So um, uh, I uh, want to thank them for everything they do. And they put on an amazing meeting in Los Angeles. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> uh, thank you.